please welcome the 14th Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Good evening. Good evening. And welcome to the Library of Congress, to all the space fans and poetry lovers with us in person and watching virtually. We are happy to welcome you to our historic Coolidge Auditorium for our Live at the Library series. You can clap. <laughs> because I hope you've had an opportunity to grab a drink or a bite to eat and to check out the incredible display from NASA and from the various centers and divisions throughout the library that have a connection to poetry and space exploration. Before we begin, I'd like to give a wonderful and heartfelt thanks to NASA, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and the staff on the Europa Clipper mission for this historic collaboration with the library and the Poet Laureate. Carl Sagan famously said, imagination will of, often carry us to the worlds that never were, but without it, we go nowhere. And the Library of Congress is the home of the Carl Sagan papers. And through our collections and programs, we encourage people to broaden their minds, expand their imaginations, and to cultivate their passions. Libraries are at the intersection of the arts and sciences. And the relationship between the two are vital and undeniable, which brings us to tonight. So let me tell you a little bit about the Poet Laureate position at the Library of Congress. It was created in 1937, thanks to a generous gift from Archer Huntington. And it was renamed by an act of Congress in 1985. The Laureate is our nation's poet and she champions poetry across the country by reading her own work and by taking on projects and initiatives. That is why it is a great honor for me to welcome the 24th Poet Laureate of the United States tonight to debut her poem for the Europa Clipper Mission. So please join me in welcoming the brilliant and talented Ada Lamont. <laughs> Hello. Hello, you beautiful people. What a pleasure and honor it is to be with you all here tonight. Um, it, uh, it has been the greatest honor and privilege of my life to be asked to write a poem that will be engraved on the Europa Clipper spacecraft and launched in October of 2024 to go to the second moon of Jupiter, Europa. And when I was asked to write this poem, I celebrated for exactly 20 seconds. <laughs> and then I proceeded to completely freak out. <laughs> and um, I really, um, uh, it has been such a beautiful journey to make this this, this poem, a true human endeavor. And uh, I'm, I'm very excited to share, share it with you today. The unveiling. In praise of mystery, a poem for Europa. Arching under the night sky, inky with black expansiveness, we point to the planet's we know, we pin quick wishes on stars. From Earth, we read the sky as if it is an unerring book of the universe, expert and evident. Still, there are mysteries below our sky. The whale song, 
the songbird singing its call in the bough of a wind-shaken tree. We are creatures of constant awe, curious at beauty, at leaf and blossom, at grief and pleasure, sun and shadow. And it is not darkness that unites us, not the cold distance of space, but the offering of water. Each drop of rain, each rivulet, each pulse, each vein, O oh, second moon, we too are made of water, of vast and beckoning seas. We too are made of wonders, of great and ordinary loves, of small, invisible worlds, of a need to call out through the dark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> you try. Thank you. Oh, they're still standing. Ada, they're still standing. Was that cool or what? <laughs> oh, my goodness. So much has happened since we were last together on this stage over six months ago. I know. Uh, could you tell us about your first term? Yeah. Um, you know, th this has been a very exceptional year. <laughs> um, and when I stood on the stage with you in September, um, I never could have guessed where all of this would lead. Um, and so, as you know, I've, I've been to the White House many times. I've, many times. <laughs> I've, uh, I've uh, State dinner. Just <laughs> seem to be hanging out with first ladies a lot. Um, and, um, and I think one of the, the most beautiful things that have come out of this is um, is doing this uh, NASA collaboration with the Library of Congress and NASA. It's been really beautiful. You're taking poetry up to space, <laughs> and it's wonderful. So tell us a little bit about your time at the White House. <laughs> we all want to know, because she's been in, what, three, four times. <laughs> they call up and say, is the Poet Laureate available? <laughs> We're having a state dinner. <laughs> and we thought, because the First Lady... Yeah. Dr. Biden really connected with you. Yeah, you know, one of the things that um, when I, the first time I met Dr. Biden, I thought, um, I, I went to her team and I said, how do you refer to her? And they said, well, she will tell you to call her Jill. And I said, well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> um, so what do you say? They said, we call her Dr. B. I said, okay, I can do that. Um, but I still, of course, when I met her, I said, well, Dr. Biden, you know, <laughs> nice to meet you. And she looked at me and she said, I've read all your work. She had. And um, it was one of those moments that you felt like, I, you know, I had no words for. And, um, and uh, we, we've connected in numerous ways, but I think really she is a true lover of literature, um, as you know, as well you know. So that has been delightful. And one of, one of the trips in September, we were invited to um, the um, Hispanic Heritage Celebration in the White House. And... When we arrived, we, um, like my husband and I often do, you've met my lovely, beautiful husband, and we went all the way to the back. <laughs> you know, I'm a poet at heart. There's a little introvert in there. And so we went all the way to the back, and um, there, there was uh, President Biden and, and Dr. Biden, and then um, suddenly Dr. Biden started reading my poem, Dead Stars, which, interestingly enough, has the line in it that says... Um, uh, that's talking about pointing to the stars. What would happen, you know, if we, you know, if we, if, if we, if we launched our demands into the sky? Which is so strange because, of course, that poem was written before we're launching anything into the sky. At least for me. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, it's been a real, it's it's been a real honor to be there. So you've been busy with other parts of the federal government, and now that's why we're here tonight. So how did this happen with the connection with NASA and all of that? Yeah. Um, 
You know, we first got an email, and then it was a, you know, it's Brett at the, in the Office of Communication immediately set up a call, and we were in the Office of Communications. I was here in the library, and we all gathered around Brett's office, and we met with NASA, and the Zoom call was so interesting because they just kept telling us this about this marvelous mission, the Europa Clipper, and you know, like all, you know, all about Europa and this watery uh, world. And I kept thinking, what, what's you know? And then Did you think they were going to ask you to go? Yeah, it was like, <laughs> am I, am I going to have to go? Uh -huh. <laughs> we would have supported you. First poet laureate in space. <laughs> oh. We can still do that. Watch it. It can happen. <laughs> so then, but then you understood, right? Yeah. Yeah, and there was a moment where um, we got off the call, and they said, you know, it, would you be willing to create an original poem for this? And I thought, I mean, yes. <laughs> um, and we got off, and we were like, oh, my gosh, we're going to go. This is amazing. And everyone was still celebrating, and I just was like, oh, no. <laughs> I now have to write a poem <laughs> that will be, and at this point, I actually didn't know it would be engraved on the side of the space Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, and um, I'm actually kind of glad I didn't know that. Um, there were some things that was good to hide from my brain when I was writing the poem. <laughs> so you spent, I understand, some time in Hawaii mm -hmm. at the former home of another poet laureate yeah. as you were writing this. So tell us about that. Yeah, um, actually the timing worked out really well, in which uh, I was invited to go to the Merwin Conservancy, which is the former home of the poet laureate, um, the 19th poet laureate, uh, W.S. Merwin. And um, he had created a 20-acre palm forest in, uh, in this beautiful, beautiful, all, you know, hand planting these palm trees. And um, I thought, well, this is where I will go write the poem. And uh, as I was in this beautiful space, um, I kept thinking, okay, very seriously, I you know, wrote every single day, I would write a new draft every day, and I would, you know, I kept reading them to my husband. And my husband finally said, I think you need to stop writing a NASA poem. <laughs> and it was such wisdom. And I immediately got annoyed, because he's always right. And I, and I said, yeah. He said, you need to write a you poem. You need to write a poem that you would write. And it was, it really changed everything. And I went back to the drawing board. I scrapped everything. And um, there was one line that I had originally written actually during the Zoom call. Um, and, that, and that line was the one that survived. But yeah, I, I went and created a whole new poem. And that's what I, I was like, oh, he's right. I need to write a poem that I would write, that I want to write, um, and not keep thinking about the audience and keep thinking about that. I had to shut some of that out. Yeah, that was, and did you know that it was going to be on the side of the thing? Not, yeah. not yet. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. Yeah, it was so very you good. Still I did not know that. You were was, still flowing. You were still doing yeah, that. Yeah. And then you went to visit the Jet Propulsion Laboratory yeah. in your home state of California. Now, yeah. what was that like? Yeah, and I remember. Uh, when we they set it up, they were like, well, would you be interested in going? And I was like, yes, of course, I want to see this. And we had this amazing time there. Um, the team, the, the whole Clipper team and the JPL team are just really generous and kind and um, really took us through how it was being built. And we went to see it being built in the clean room. Whoa, the and, clean um, room. Yeah, it was really <laughs> remarkable. I liked it. Um, and we went to Mission Control. And, oh. You know, it was like... Really fascinating and, and incredible. Were you kind of wondering, wait a minute, they're showing me mission control. Were you still wondering, <laughs> is it just the poem that's going yeah, on? Exactly. You know, because you would, because we have yeah. a video clip, from what I understand, <laughs> of your uh, time there to show. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's NASA we have. <laughs> This explains uh, binary numbers. They figured that if we could talk to them, it would be the language of science. This is very JPL because it's this just perfect intersection of creativity 
I need total nerdiness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exploration and you know, poetry, art, words can can both transport us, right? They like explode our imaginations in the best possible way. And yeah. And almost always we begin in questions yeah. and gosh, we gosh, end gosh. it in more questions. Right. Right? It doesn't it never, it end never in an answer. answer. And I That's feel like exploration is similar. Engineers in this room are responsible for monitoring and maintaining the data flow. And since 1964, that data has been delivered to this room. That's why That's we right. call it the center of the universe. <laughs> What do you think of it? I love it. I kept returning to this being a human endeavor too, and an earth endeavor, right? Like there's this, the level of that connection that it's not just about out there, but also here. And that that had to be mirrored in the fall. That is so cool. Wow. So what what was it like to meet the scientists that were behind this? And Incredible, I, you know. Immediately, I, I kept asking them more about you know. So it says there's, there's all the ingredients for life. What does that mean? You know, all these things. And one of my favorite parts about talking to um, the scientists there is that, you know, what they wanted to talk about, poetry. <laughs> Good. Did they ask you questions yeah. about what you... And it was, it was very, it was one of my favorite moments was here we were sort of full of like, how do you make a spacecraft? How does it, you know, and they were like, how do you make a poem? You know, <laughs> <laughs> it was really great. There's a science to that too in a different yeah. way. Yeah. And they could understand yeah. what you have to do mm -hmm. to produce what you do. Yeah, and that idea of curiosity and, you know, how you make something and also the idea of, Again, beginning in questions and ending in questions, you know, that it's not about finding one ultimate answer, but instead existing in wonder. Existing in wonder. Well, we have a special treat mm -hmm. because we have uh, someone that will tell us more about the mission uh, behind the poem and how all of you can be part of it. So I'd like to welcome to the stage Dr. Nicola Fox, who is an associate administrator. She, Dr. Fox, is the associate administrator of NASA Space Mission Directorate. And she said we could call her Dr. Nikki. You just call me Nikki. Nikki. Yeah. So it's just wonderful. And so, well, tell us about that directorate and, and how your rope would get. Oh, the Science Mission Directorate is, is just a wonderful place. Um, we do, you know, little tiny goals, um, things like, you know, protecting and improving life on Earth, um, searching for life elsewhere, and unlocking the secrets of the universe. So, no, you know. It's all in a day's work. Or in other words, Monday. Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Neat. Neat. <laughs> well, now what about the Europa Clipper mission in particular now? Yes, yeah, so um, it, uh, the, the directorate is made up of, of wonderful scientists. We have six different divisions. Um, I've obviously, I'm gonna talk about planetary science because that is the home of the Europa Clipper mission. Um, but the planetary science studying all of the planets and moons in our solar system. Um, astrophysics looking beyond our solar system into other galaxies and telling us about life elsewhere. We have biological and physical sciences that actually study you know, how we adapt and, and and survive in space and how we can better um, our food here and how things can be adaptable when we want to send our long, long duration missions to Mars and even beyond. Um, we have our um, Earth Science Division, which of course is looking after our home planet and telling us you know, about climate and about how we can better protect our planet. We have heliophysics uh, that studies the sun and everything that the sun touches. Um, and then we have uh, another uh, division, Joint Agency uh, Satellite Division, that does all our partnerships with NOAA. And literally, these, these divisions work together to do those really lofty goals that I, I started with. Um, we, also have, we also work really closely with the other mission directorates. We work closely with our exploration 
um, partners, with our humans in space partners, with our aeronautics, with technology. Um, so as we as we now venture off off the Earth back to have a sustained presence at the moon and then onto Mars, uh, we go together. We go um, with science enabling exploration and exploration enabling science. And exploration is the heart of the Europa Clipper mission. Um, so we are going to journey out um, to the icy moon, so beautifully described in your poem, um, that, that uh, Jupiter's um, icy moon uh, will travel, uh, will do about I'm going to give the number, even though I've been told it was iffy, 49 close, pa close pa uh, passes of um, the moon. Um, and we're actually going to be looking for um, sort of signatures of things that could sustain life. Um, so, you know, we do think that Europa is probably, after Earth, the most likely place to actually be suitable to sustain life. Yes. It is not a life detection mission, but it is going to... Just um, let us go. I had to put that in there. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, it, but it's going to look for the conditions um, that would sustain wow. life you were talking about. So water, energy, um, you know, the, the sustainability, um, just just that, that things that actually could sustain life. So um, Europa Clipper, super, super exciting mission. Made even more exciting because we're gonna have a poem on the side of you it. You sure are. Yeah. All right. That's gonna be so cool. But you've also uh, launched something that I understand you call message in a bottle. Yes. So tell us about that and how we can all do it, because we might want to go up there. <laughs> well, we'd love you to all come with us. Uh, so Message in a Bottle is a wonderful campaign that's, that's really, for me, so you know, one of the things I'm most excited about with what we do at NASA is, is continually striving to lower the boundaries and let more people um, just come and experience the excitement of science. You know, you don't need a PhD to be a scientist. You just need to love asking questions. You have to be curious and you want to know more about the world around you, the universe around you, the solar system around you. You just need to know, want to know more. And so we want to actually invite people to come with us. So not only will this beautiful poem be engraved on the side, um, on the chip, on the, that will be put on the spacecraft, but we actually invite everybody to um, send your names in to us and we will engrave your names on a chip. So you will come on, I think it's something like 1.8 billion mile journey with us um, to, uh, to, to just you know, explore um, the regions around Jupiter. Um, and it's a beautiful partnership. So it's, it's between the Library of Congress, um, of course, our Poet Laureate, NASA, the Jet Propulsion Lab. Um, and it's, it's got lots of different facets. So we're sort of kicking it off today. Um, and uh, with, of course, the, the reading of the poem, it kind of kicks it off. Um, yeah. But it, it's really bringing together, you know, the, the, the poem just brings sort of likens, you know, the Earth with this icy moon. Um, and and it's, it's that sort of bringing together of two different places, a watery moon um, so far away from us with Earth, um, bringing together these two different things. And this campaign just lets us bring together untapped um, people who've never really experienced science before. And so um, do you guys wanna know how you can join the campaign? We have a video. And this is, I have to tell you, this collaboration with NASA is just super cool. <laughs> <laughs> they know, uh, the video, we have a video, video. that yeah. NASA produced. Here's how okay. you can get involved in NASA's Message in a Bottle campaign and read and add your name to U.S. Poet Laureate Ada Lamone's poem for Europa. Go to your preferred web browser and type in go.nasa.gov slash message in a bottle. Click the Send Your Name button, read the poem or listen to the poem being read by U.S. Poet Laureate Ada Lamone, enter your name and fill out your information, click the Sign On button, and congratulations. Your name will be submitted to travel over 1.8 billion miles, along with the poem to Europa on NASA's Europa Clipper spacecraft. Once you're done, you'll receive a custom piece of artwork that you can download, print, and share with your friends and family. All right. Isn't that so? 
That's marvelous. Pretty cool. And it's, it's, you know, that's only a little part of the campaign. Um, we'll be doing sort of campaign integration with the Library of Congress website, social media, ongoing outreach. So you think it's cool that NASA's partnering with you. We think it's cool you're partnering with us. <laughs> oh, so, well, awesome thank job. you. Well, in 2000, the Library of Congress launched the John W. Kluge Center to bring scholars from around the world to connect with our collections. And just over a decade later, the library and NASA's astrobiology program created the Baroque S. Bloomberg, NASA Library of Congress Chair in Astrobiology. I feel smart just saying that. <laughs> oh, exploration and scientific innovation for a scholar working to understand and bring understanding to the interface between human society and scientific exploration of the cosmos. And for the last part of our conversation, I'm very pleased to welcome our current chair, Dr. Sherry Wells Jensen. And just in full disclosure, uh, I have to tell you that Dr. Wells Jensen has another project that they told us do not start and mention. So we should have known that I was going to do it. Water. But that we'll talk about that if we have time. But Dr. Jensen, I'd like to start with you because we are going to have a conversation with him. What, in the broadest sense, could you tell us what it means for humankind to even send messages into space? Why do we do it? Well, that's a really good question because honestly, from some perspectives, we don't honestly have to, right? We've got this beautifully constructed machine here. It could go out on its own. It knows how to do things. It could perform all the experiments. It could do the analysis. It could just boom, be on its merry way back to Earth, no problem, or wherever it's gonna go. It doesn't need us. But at its heart, the thing that we're doing here that, that search for the potential of life is not just a set of experiments, it's not just an analysis, it's also something intensely human. Mm -hmm. It's a deep quest. I think we all sort of feel that question. Mm -hmm. Is there any, can there be anything out yeah. there? Do we have to be the only ones? Is there any potential for life, right? Mm -hmm. And so this is living things reaching out for the potential of other living things. Mm -hmm. It's so deeply important. And Honestly, every deeply important human endeavor begins with some kind of greeting. Mm -hmm. So there are 7,000 uh, languages in the world, and all the languages have words for things like sun and moon and water and all those kinds of things. Um, but they also all have dozens and dozens and dozens of words for greeting one another, for ways of saying hello and ways of saying you're welcome, but you're welcome here, and here's my name, and can we please connect? Would that be okay? Mm -hmm. um, and, and for example, what Dr. Hayden did so beautifully and so graciously to begin this whole event was exactly that, right? She greeted everybody, mm. she bid everybody welcome, this is important, gather here, become uh, connected to one another, give everyone an understanding of why we're here, and she offered us her name, just like your names are all mm. gonna go to space, mm -hmm. because your names are essential, mm -hmm. right? It's the beginning of a relationship, and we, we aren't gonna have any maybe measurable relationship between us and little pieces of goo or you know hunks of water, <laughs> whatever the heck gloriously messy and interesting nerdy things we find on Europa. But, <laughs> but that's still the, the, the urge to connect is so important and we want so much to say things. And so it's not so much that we need to hear back, but we need to send the message because the message itself is, it's nestled so deeply into the essence of who we are that it's impossible for us to do anything important without sort of putting a greeting on it, right? Mm. Before we send it off. Mm. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. Well, at the library, we have a history of sending messages. And you can find out more about those in our collections. And in fact, tonight, we had displayed one of the gold-plated copper discs called Sounds of the Earth, but more commonly referred to as Golden Records from the Voyager space mission. And we have an image of that. So, Dr. Fox, can you tell us a little bit more about these efforts and, and how NASA understands them? 
Yeah, the, the Voyager, uh, the two Voyager spacecraft, the Voyager mission, you know, launched in 1977 and still going strong. It's mm -hmm. just beautiful. Just, they, just, they just turned 45, yeah. They, they, turned, they had their 45th birthday last uh, December. Um, and and it, you know, it's, it's they, they, they just incredible stuff, you know, bringing us really the first views with Voyager 1, the first views of, of Jupiter and Saturn, you know, really inspiring missions like the Europa Clipper. You know, we've seen these amazing planets, we've seen these incredible moons, now we really want to go study them. And so they've really inspired um, us to do more. You know, Voyager 2 going past Uranus and Neptune. Um, you may have seen those beautiful James Webb telescope images recently of Uranus and Neptune, just giving us unprecedented views of them. And, you know, of course, um, in the planetary decadal, a, a mission to go to Uranus is one of the big recommendations. So just really inspiring us. But then, um, then they transitioned, you know, they, they did their big planet tour and then they transitioned and became heliophysics missions, um, actually giving us information about the outer reaches of our solar system. So, you know, beyond Pluto, way, way out there, actually crossing into interstellar space. And so Voyager 1 crossed in August of 2012, um, Voyager 2 went in November of 2018, um, crossing in very different locations, um, going outside into interstellar space. So basically um, into the region where, where we're, it, they're no longer protected by the sun and the solar wind, uh, which carves out kind of a bubble for our whole solar system as it orbits around the Milky Way and it protects us from the vagaries of interstellar space. Yay sun. Mm -hmm. um, and. Um, and, and they're in this sort of region where they're, they're, it's like, you know, all the sort of, all the stars that have died and have remnants and they're in that interstellar um, region and they're still going and they're still sending back data um, thanks to our deep space network. Mm -hmm. They're still spending us, oh, oh the, yeah. there we go. Uh oh. NASA in the house. <laughs> uh oh. Yeah. You know you've got a geeky audience when you get a cheer for deep I know. space. I know. <laughs> So we're just, you know, we're just geeking out, you know, because the library also has a letter from 1977 by Carl Sagan, who was working on behalf of NASA to the renowned folklorist Alan Lomax about gathering the music for the Golden Records. And we have an image of that letter and Sagan writes, we believe that public availability of a two record album identical in content with the flight record will sim stimulate listeners to examine our civilization and culture and consider how we wish to be represented to the cosmos. Mm -hmm. In addition, it may be for many people a first exposure to some of the diversity and quality of human music. So with that example and that hope that uh, we consider how we wish to be represented to the cosmos. Mm. What do you think poetry offers mm. as a message from Earth and a reflection of who we are, mm. that we are sending poetry? Mm. Well, Ada, you oh, know I want you to. I, thought, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I, that would be great. Think about <laughs> it. Um, Think about it. I was really getting comfortable listening. Um, no, no, no. I, you know, I think that what I love about poetry is that it really is deeply human. And that it, as opposed to music and as opposed to some of the other different things that we've sent, uh, one of the things that poetry does is it's, it's, uh, it has to include everything, right? The music is in the poem. The bass line is in the poem. It's in the repetition. Um, everything is in the poem. It has to be complete on its own. And so what I love about it, um, it I love the Golden Record, so this is nothing against the Golden Record. <laughs> Don't at me, Voyager. <laughs> you um, almost were going up in space <laughs> you said that. <laughs> I, I really do love that it doesn't have to be played. It doesn't have to, we don't have to right. figure out. It just, it just has to be there and it includes everything. And it includes human breath. Um, when you read a poem and when you experience poem, you're walking into someone else's breath. You're, you're understanding how that line break, sejura, whatever is working in the poem is part of that human connection. Um, so that's one of the things that I find really moving about it. And Dr. Wells Jensen, 
in terms of a message that you would send or how you think we've... Well, I, I think it's really important to clarify that so maybe water is water chemically on Europa, and maybe what maybe that's the same chemical here. It's just two hydrogens and oxygen, no big deal. But water <laughs> is a it's essentially a different substance here because of the purposes and the appreciation that we have for it. It's a different thing. And so if we're going out looking for water there, we should think about what water is here and, and acknowledge and celebrate the difference between those two things because the difference is meaningful. And the difference between water there and water here is the addition of all the living things on Earth. Mm. It's a whole different thing. Mm. Before we wrap up, <laughs> I mean, I tell you, I had to get an injection of creativity, brilliance to sit here with these <laughs> ladies today. You, you should know that. Um, but we had a special presentation, though, uh, for uh, Ada. Many of you may know that the Library of Congress is home to the US Copyright Office and all of Ada's poetry collections are copyrighted. But for the first time, she's copyrighted just a poem. <laughs> and so here to present a certificate of copyright. It's very <laughs> official now. <laughs> for in praise of mystery, George. Thank you. Beautiful. Aroni. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. And George is our Deputy Director of the Office of Public Information and Education for the U.S. Copyright, and he's so delighted to be able to present that. <laughs> Very cool. Well, I you're really official now. <laughs> so, and finally, we want to leave you with one more experience of Ada's poem, thanks to our friends at NASA's Europa Clipper mission. And we have something oh, yeah. special to show you. In Praise of Mystery, a poem for Europa. Arching under the night sky, inky with black expansiveness, we point to the planets we know. We pin quick wishes on stars. From Earth, we read the sky as if it is an unerring book of the universe, expert and evident. Still, there are mysteries below our sky. The whale song, the songbird singing its call in the bow of a wind-shaken tree. We are creatures of constant awe. Curious at beauty, at leaf and blossom, at grief and pleasure, sun and shadow. And it is not darkness that unites us, not the cold distance of space, but the offering of water. Each drop of rain, each rivulet, each pulse, each vein. Oh, second moon, we too are made of water of vast and beckoning seas. We too are made of wonders, of great and ordinary loves, of small invisible worlds, of a need to call out through the dark. Thanks again to this amazing stage of presenters, uh, our Librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden. Our U.S. Poet Laureate, Ada Lamone. And our special guests, Dr. Nicola Fox and Dr. Sherry Wells Jensen. Yay!
I'm Rob Casper, head of poetry and literature at the Library of Congress, and I want to tell you again that you can sign up for the Message in a Bottle campaign at go.nasa.gov slash message in a bottle. So please do. Uh, you can also go to lsu.gov to learn more about the Poet Laureate and the Library of Congress. And for those of you here in the audience, we hope you come back. The Jefferson Building is open late each Thursday night for programs and exhibits such as this, as well as happy hour drinks and food. Thanks so much and have a good night.